welcome to the first InfoSec Recruitment and Hiring podcast hosted by Peer Talk. Uh, I'm Rosie Anderson from the UK. We've got a truly global panel, including uh, Chris Bride from Los Angeles and Tyson from San Francisco, who's a hiring manager. So very much like to thank you for both attending. Unfortunately, Thomas isn't available. Uh, he has recently had a baby, so we're, we're assuming that uh, sleepless nights are causing him a few problems at the moment. So unfortunately, he's not available to join us at the moment. Uh, but I'd like to introduce, uh, well, I'd like to let both Tyson and Chris introduce themselves. Um, so take it away, Chris. Thank you very much, Rosie. Um, so yeah, Chris Rides, I'm, uh, I'm CEO or Chief Everything Officer, as I'd like to call it, for uh, Tyro Security. Um, we're an information security recruiting and professional services company based out of Los Angeles. Uh, we've been running for around five years, and my personal background is on uh, the recruiting side rather than the technical side. It's my business partner that's the technical one. And uh, I've been working in recruitment for 17 years now. Uh, started off in the UK, hence the accent, and uh, been over in the States for eight years. Over to you, Tyson. Hi, my name is Tyson. I'm the VP of Security at Opportune. Uh, we're a financial services company that is based um, out of uh, Redwood City in California. Um, I'm, uh, as alluded to, I'm the hiring manager on the call. Um, and in relation to you know, me constantly needing additional resources or building out the, the teams and functionalities uh, within my security program, um, I obviously need to work uh, fairly closely with recruiters in the industry to find the talent that I need at the time. Okay, well, how I wanted to run this was uh, to have two people, uh, two recruiters talking about how they tend to run a vacancy, and then for Tyson, if you can uh, ask any questions and talk through how you like to work with agencies and the process that you follow. Um, unfortunately, if Thomas isn't available, I'm going to take the other place. Um, but Chris, I don't know if you want to run through first. Do you have uh, a certain type of role that you recruit for every time? Would you recruit for information security as a whole? Yeah, we, we're a really information security and, and audit related to information security are the areas that we um, focus on. Uh, we do a lot of technical recruiting, so very typical for, for us to see sort of information security engineers, analysts, and app application security engineering people. Um, they're the kind of uh, vacancies we tend to get. Uh, and we, we have a process that, that we run through, um, which I know you were asking about processes, so maybe if I kind of run through the process that we tend to follow, just in a, a big overview of it. Um, generally, when we, when we first get a, a role from a client, um, Usually the first thing we do is to, to make sure that we've got a full understanding of uh, the actual job description from the hiring manager, ideally. Um, and, and sometimes that's a matter of working closely with uh, human resources or an internal recruiting department to, to arrange that call. Um, without that call, um, we generally struggle to, to, to make that role a priority. And reasons behind that are, are, are probably 90% at least of the positions that we get in writing as a job spec, when we then speak to the, the manager and run through what they're looking for, there's quite a big difference. Um, and so typically we'll, we'll have those phone calls first of all. Uh, we'll of course un make, have make sure we've got an understanding of, of who the company are, um, what are the, the selling benefits around working for that company. Uh, try to get a good understanding of salary or rate ranges depending on if it's contract or permanent. If they're looking at, at the location it specifically needs to be based in, you know, will they cover relocation, uh, information security markets um, highly um, highly in demand for, for great individuals and, and so often we have to look at relocating individuals for that. And then for, for the, the US and, uh, and I imagine you know, back when I was in the UK it was similar, are we looking at people that, um, you know, have visas or people that will be able to be sponsored for a visa or do they, you know, will they accept green cards? Is there anything around that, you know, a US citizen perhaps if uh, if this, the, the role is security cleared? So we try to understand that the recruitment process is really important so we can manage the candidate's expectations on how long the process will take and the different steps um, and get, you know, get an idea of 
what's driving the need for the vacancy. Um, so that's kind of the information gathering stage. Um, the step after that is to start using that to reach out, whether that's advertising um, on our site or on various uh, other sites that are available out there, um, using an, uh, our, our network. Um, we're personally really heavily involved in um, the, the not only Los Angeles, but the security community as a whole. So we go to all of the security conferences. Um, I've, I've spoken at a number of, of the big ones here in the US. My business partner actually is out speaking at IoT World this week uh, on the security of mm -hmm. IoT devices. He's the technical part of our partnership. Um, so we, we have a good network through doing those sort of things. Um, we're also, I founded the Cloud Security Alliance here, so uh, here in LA. So I've been very involved with the local communities for, for that. And we use that network to try and find individuals that typically are, are more passive, um, that aren't advertising, uh, that aren't looking at adverts, um, and then try and give those give those people across once they've been fully qualified to the to the client, and then manage all of the expectations and process from there. Hopefully, to an offer. Um, so that's the kind of an overview of the steps we go through. Okay, over in the UK, um, I'm sure we probably work quite similarly, to be honest. I mean, I manage outsourced cyber recruitment team, and we kind of structure ourselves. So we have five disciplines that we recruit in. So for, um, for me, I started out recruiting purely for pen testers to really try and get an understanding of that as a market, as understand the candidate community, understand the salaries, the availability of the talent in the UK, sort of all across the UK, both contract and perm. One of my colleagues covers information assurance. Somebody else covers security architecture. I've now started to look more at the senior appointments, the sort of threat and vulnerability managers, the CISOs, and that enables us when we pick up a vacancy. So we're, we're a specialist division as part of a larger IT recruiter. So if it is a more generalist IT role, it would fit somewhere else. If it was specialist cyber and fit into our four or five areas, because we also cover SOC analysts as well, then we would, it would fall to us to kind of work that role, whether it's a, a new customer that we're dealing with or whether it's a preferred supplier customer like a big bank that the business recruits for as a whole. So how exactly the same, I like to speak to the person who's, who's got the need, who's got the pain, who's recruited for the role, just to fully understand what they want. A job spec is two-dimensional. Like you said, 90% of the time, stuff that's on there isn't correct, isn't right not every organization wants to put what seeing tool they're working with and all the technologies that they're working with out into the open marketplace so by speaking to the manager you can properly understand what they want and we try and be consultative so because we work in our own verticals we can say mm, your salary is a little bit out um, if you want somebody at that salary you might have to lower the expectations and look at somebody who's ready to go through a qualification or we can say actually your salary is really good um, sometimes we get that. Um, that will help us to find you maybe a more senior candidate than what you necessarily wanted. Uh, but by being consultative and pushing back to the customer and saying, okay, there's 50 pen testers in my, mark, in my network at the moment who are active. I can tell you now, if you want someone security cleared, for example, you might only have three available. If you want somebody in London, I've got eight available. If you want a check team leader, I've only got four available in your location. That allows us to be a lot more consultative and kind of manage the customer's expectations as well. Yeah, I think that's a that's a really good point. That's I think that's one of the benefits for working with a, a, a company um, or a division that, that specialises in one particular area. It's that consulting ability and the ability to like let you know. I, I know when companies come to us um, with a requirement. Um, and we've got a team here, so it's split differently with each, within each team member. But when they come to us with a requirement, m a majority of the time, they, once we've already got the highlights, we already know why they're struggling to fill that position. Yeah. Uh, and I think that is that approach you talk about, about being in one particular area. Um, it'd be great to hear, I guess, sorry, you probably, I'm probably stepping on your shoes a bit here, Rosie, but I'd love to hear from Tyson. You're very in terms welcome. Of where, <laughs> where, where, where they see you know the, the the process from their end and then also you know listening to what we've talked about where they maybe see gaps because you know we'd love to do a better job right 
Yeah, definitely. So I send over to you. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so largely, as you as you just kind of described the uh, consulting aspect of and the, the general high level process of what each of you uh, go through, um, it's pretty much been my experience, and that's generally how we work with recruiters. Um, I think what I have found um, which kind of helps um, the process that much more is I, I like to try and approve the dynamics across three different areas. One, one is in relation to how we construct the um, job profile. Um, there's, there's two kind of two things that we, we key on. One is um, building in kind of a, a, a amount of flexibility on the roles and responsibilities. So it's a little bit wider versus something that's very narrow. Because um, just given that the, there's a gap of skills out there, it's better to look for someone that has a little bit wider breadth of skills uh, versus someone that's very specific or, or very um, siloed. Um, the other aspect of it is we really try to focus on reasonability. Um, you know, I've, I've seen it a number of times where folks are looking for, you know, a, a junior position, but they're, you know, demanding eight years of experience with 10 different certificate or, or certifications, um, which it doesn't make any sense. Um, and you're just not going to be able to find anyone, which, you know, not only is not um, it's not going to be successful for the person that's hiring. It's not, it's not going to be a successful engagement with the, the recruiting firm as well. Um, the other two dynamics that we, we also kind of look at is um, cultural fit um, within the company itself. Um, so it's not just a matter of um, finding someone um, that is going to meet the, the skill set that you're looking for. It's making sure that they're going to be successful uh, within the team that they're actually working in. Um, now, obviously, that is kind of hard to do from a pre-screening, but you can, you can kind of ahead of time, based on their profile, based on the things that they've been working on, um, get a, some initial insight into whether or not they're, they're culturally going to fit into the environment that they're going to be working in. Um, and of course, as you go through the interview process, you, you further flush that out. Um, and then the third dynamic um, that we, we, we tend to try and also overlay on the process is a person's um, uh, malleability. And when I say malleability, it's their ability to, to flex up or flex down or flex across various things. Um, because in reality, what we, what we have found is the folks that are, that are able to kind of grow over time, uh, learn new skills, uh, take on new roles and, or new roles and responsibilities, um, end up being just that much more um, successful uh, when we bring them on board. Um, so again, it goes back to the, that, that perspective of constructing the job so that it's a little bit wider versus something that's very narrow um, in hindsight. Okay, that sounds, um, that, sorry, that sounds, that sounds perfect to me. How do you work with recruiters at the moment? Uh, how, how do you, well, what do you find works really well and what, what's your biggest bugbear? What we're, well, so what works really well is, again, that consultative nature where we sit down and we talk about those three dynamics um, and really work together through the process um, to, to narrow down and, and, and zero in on the folks that we actually want to talk to. Um, so for example, when, when I work with a recruiter, though, we'll start profiling people together on LinkedIn. Like, here's generally who someone I might be looking for. Here's generally who someone I might be working for. Um, and <clears throat> from there, the recruiter is able to uh, really understand what it is that we're looking for um, and then can construct a, a list of folks that they think that we should probably be talking to, which we then go through and go, yes, this is who we're looking for, or here's another individual. Um, and then we can work through the interview process from that. What doesn't work well, um, is when that consultative um, interaction doesn't take place. Um, so for example, if I just get a long list of people um, that are not really relative to what it is I'm looking for, or I have to necessarily weed through and, and, and kind of find um, the, the, the needle in the haystack, um, it's not going to be an accessible engagement, not only for myself looking for the resources, but also the people on the other hand um, who end up getting bombarded from the recruiter saying, oh, are you interested in this position? Are you interested in this position? Because it's not 
necessarily something that um, is going to be really relative or engaging for them to, to actually think about. Um, and in addition, on the flip side, um, when, I, when we also talk to the recruiters, there's also another element is we help them construct um, that actual initial engagement and the further on conversation with the person that they want to talk to um, so that they know how to actually sell the position as well. Um, because it's one thing for us to be interested in someone, they've also got to be interested in us. Um, so that's another, I guess, di aspect of that dynamic to ensure success. I think that's a very valid point. I think definitely in a, a skills shortage, and we'll come on to that um, from the questions from the community shortly, I think organisations do need to be aware that it is a two-way process. There are candidates that are definitely in demand that are looking at multiple roles, and it, it's, you're very right to invest that time working with the right recruiters who are going to do a really good job of selling you in your business and your role, but also understand your values and your culture and how to sell that properly into the marketplace. Chris, do you want to respond to that? Would you agree with that point? I, yeah, I'd completely agree, and it's really good to hear hear that coming from you know hear, hearing your process and coming from a hiring manager about the importance of having that consultative uh, uh, approach and 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 wide you know widening you know what you're actually looking for. Um, I know I've got a few other questions from from specific people, and I'm sure that will come up as, as some of the answers um, because. It, yeah, it's good to hear that that that, you, that you're doing that, and I'd I'd love to find more hiring managers that 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 will work in the same way, because um, it, it isn't always that common, unfortunately. Don't know whether it's the same in the UK, but here in the in the US, that's the case anyway. Yeah, I I agree. Um, on the subject of shortage of candidates, there's a few uh, uh, peer listers that have asked about: Is there really a shortage of skilled candidates within InfoSec? And why won't organisations train candidates? So, I mean, what you recruit for, Chris, do you find, is it hard to find the right talent for, for vacancies? Um, yeah, it definitely is. And um, I think there's a couple of there's a couple of reasons behind that. I, I, I mean, I, I, I was thinking about this and I was thinking, well, I, there's, there's a shortage of perfectly skilled unicorns in our industry, right? There's no doubt of that. Um, and unfortunately, many of the requirements we get are looking for exactly that. They're looking for, for people that do exist out there, but there's probably three or four of them and they're happy working where they are and they don't live anywhere near where the role's located. So um, it's having that consultative approach to getting people to, to widen up um, their, what they're looking for to actually look at where areas where there are going to be more candidates, and and I still don't mean you know when when we do do this with with managers, I'm, I'm not talking about suddenly opening up a pool of candidates where, you know, I, I can turn around and say right yeah we'll have what, five resumes across to you that fit that perfectly tomorrow because that's not the marketplace that that, that security is working in. So I mean I, I believe that there is certainly um, a shortage. Um, I do also think there's a lot of unrealistic expectations out there um, around the mix of skill sets that people want and also about um, how much time companies will put into maybe training or taking somebody. I think often it's a mixture because, I mean, it's a very well-paid um, industry and many companies look at uh, information security, you know, okay, it's part of the IT department and and. And so when they start looking at the very high salaries they need to pay somebody, they want to, to, to actually train somebody and pay those salaries. It, it, it doesn't yeah, sort it's of doesn't compute. Both ways. Yeah, exactly. So they're looking and saying, right, we're paying a lot more than we are for a general IT person, and you're telling me that we have to actually also take somebody with slightly less skills in information security or have to train them in a certain area. You know, they, uh, it's... Often it's hard to, to get companies to, to understand that that's the marketplace we're in. So um, you know that's a that's a, a tough one to deal with. Um, the other thing is just looking at the drive for the company. You know we have roles that, that people that come up to us that have been looking for six months, and you know you, you ask them about how the effect's been on on their company. And to have not have that person, and they're like, well, you know, we've spread the the load amongst the current team, 
And what you don't see with doing things like that is that you know you've got people doing overtime that are often not paid overtime. Um, so that the hidden costs and stuff like that, you end up losing more staff and needing more staff because people move on and go somewhere else where yeah. they don't get as overworked. So it's tough. Um, I think companies, if if more uh, companies sort of realised that this was what was needed, and and actually I think a lot of uh, senior information security um, you know, directors, CISOs, they realise that, but it's not always that easy to explain that to, to, to boards to, to get the money um, to, to hire the right people or to provide the kind of training that will keep people locked in um, for, for a while. So I, I do think that there is a, a gap there um, and I certainly think there is a, a shortage of candidates. A question about price. Um, if you were recruiting for somebody who wanted to break in, or if you wanted to advise somebody who wanted to break into security, who maybe had general IT experience, what certificates um, or what certifications do you think are most important, or what do you feel are the most in demand? And that's another question that's come through from the community. Was that for, for me or for Tyson? It broke up a little bit uh, there. Tyson, Rosie. sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> so that that's a, that's a kind of a complex question. <laughs> um, because I, th I view someone as trying to break into the industry with actually, th th there's many many different avenues that they could do that. And it's not just a matter of um, going out and, and getting a, a certificate, per se. A certificate, I think, helps open doors in that um, going back to unrealistic expectations, um, folks like listing certificates a lot um, within the job descriptions that they're looking for. and. Certificates provide kind of a good bellwether for someone's knowledge in a particular area, um, and it's also a way for people to acquire those skills. Um, but for someone that's just literally starting out, um, going and getting a certificate can be, in my opinion, a um, maybe a not a cost-effective manner by which to uh, achieve that. Um, I think what would be more important is for folks on their own uh, to go and uh, train themselves using resources that are freely out on the internet um, and start gaining experience that way. Um, and also, you know, um, uh, participating in community like forums like PeerList and, and some of the other stuff um, to develop that rapport within the community that um, kind of gives them kind of a, a, a track record that's visibly available, um, which then um, to to, from my perspective, you can put that as part of your resume, like, hey, I'm doing this in the community, here are the things that I've been doing, um, that then becomes interesting to hiring managers versus just looking at certificates. Um, so, like I said, if, if someone was purely starting out from the ground level, I think it's, you know, seeking out things that are, you know, kind of freely available, um, seeking out communities that are going to foster and kind of take you in and, and help you kind of learn over time is probably the more proven um, method by which doing that. Um, at least that, that is my, my opinion on this, that, that particular topic. In, in the US, do you have capture the flag competitions and hackathons like they do in the UK, sort of sponsored events that organizations yeah, do? Yeah, absolutely. There, there, there are those events. Um, we haven't necessarily sponsored one ourselves, but those are there are those events that, that go on from time to time. Um, kind of capture the flag. In fact, um, uh, community colleges sometimes participate in those. Um, so you can go take some courses at a community college and then get into one of those events. Um, and again, that that becomes part of the experience that you can kind of attach to your your resume and such. That you know uh, a, a new person that is entering uh, the industry can say, you know, these, this is what I've been working on. You know, here's here are the things I've been doing. So yes, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, that's a good, um, One of the that's a great point, Rosie, on on the capture the flags. Is a like most of the, of the conferences, the big conferences, um, have the ability for for students to to go in and get sort of discounted access. Often, if you're involved mm -hmm. in the community, um, there'll there'll be giveaways for entrance to these sort of things, and most of them have sort of capture the flags, and you can just go and practice your skills in. Um, I'm on the board of advisory board of Cyberwatch West, um, which is a sort of National Science Foundation funded um, state college for state colleges out here, and they have Capture the Flags. And um, I've also worked with 
uh, on the advisory board of one of the universities here for um, for, for a similar thing, and, and certainly they they have a lot of that, uh, a lot of that capture the flags and a lot of competitions and, and places you can sort of um, get involved in in actually training yourself. And there's so much um, free sort of video and and stuff out there when you start looking. So I think Tyson's got a great point in in where you can train yourself up and and what you can do to actually get hands on things that you can put on your resume. Perfect. Um, another question from the community then. So, um, uh, to both of you really, the contractors that are looking to make the jump to permanent opportunities or um, seasoned contractors that might have uh, a gap in employment history, what advice would you give to a contractor making the move to jump into perm or a candidate returning from a career break to help them break back into work? It's a good, um, it's a good and common thing to to happen. So um, I, I feel that they they're kind of similar things to, in terms of what what you would do. Um, anybody with with breaks, I think it's really important that you're able to explain. What you were doing during that piece, you know, don't lie, don't avoid the question, you know, make sure you're you're able to to explain that. And if you can explain it on 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 your resume briefly, then it's worthwhile doing so because I, I always feel that if um you know your your resume is often your tool to get you the interview, and and the less doubts or or you know possibly negative questions that people might have in their head when they're reading that, the better. So um, I, I think. Um, Certainly, you know, be prepared to explain it, and if you can do so briefly on your resume, do it on there. Um, make sure that you have stayed as hands-on as you can, if that was possible during that break. So, um, you know, there's there's a lot of stuff that you that you can do to keep hands-on, including the sort of going online and, and and going and using these capture the flags. If you're a long-term contractor, I just think you you need to have a very good reason as to why you're now moving to permanent, because there's always going to be those doubts that you know when somebody goes from contracting into permanent it's such a change for them and they're used to um, working maybe a slightly different manner as a contractor that they're not going to enjoy it and, and they're going to want to go back to contracting so you need to have a good reason as to, to why you're making that move to, to make sure everybody's comfortable that it is something you want to do for the long term um, and you're not just filling a gap until you can go back contracting um, and really good references you know the good there's, there's pros and cons for being a contractor Sell your positives. You're going to have had have had experience in a lot of different um, a lot of different environments with potentially a lot of different skills, um, and you'd ha you'd you'd have had to get to grip very quick with new projects and people, and be able to make bonds very quickly as a contractor. So there's a lot of pros that contractors can bring to roles, and um, if you've been a great contractor, you should be able to to have plenty of references for people that, that will tell you that for each of the roles and be able to show perhaps where you've been extended when you were initially taken on. So those are the kind of things um, I, I would always recommend both contractors and people with a career break and then connect back into the industry. Look at the ISSA or OWASP or the Cloud Security Alliance or IC Squared. Get to those meetings. They're free to go to and it's a great way to build your network and and have people that are willing to go to bat for you that are known maybe in the local community. That's great advice. That, that's something I definitely agree with. Using your network, using who you know, using where you've worked before if you're, if you're trying to jump back uh, from a career break. You are right, and, and the references as well. Tyson, um, what, what's your view? Do you have concerns if a contractor CV is presented to you for a permanent role? What's, what would your normal thought process be? No, not... Not necessarily. Um, I think to to Chris's point, it, it kind of depends on how someone structures their story, um, and it's not just the, the the story. In I ask you the question, and it's like, why are you getting you know back into industry and in, in permanent position? Um, it also starts with just how they construct their resume. Um, you know, what are the things that they've been doing? If there's a gap. Um, you know, have they been going to these these meetings or these events? Are they participating in the community? Um, so again, it, it it really goes back to kind of how they construct that picture of themselves. Um, not only in person, again, when I'm having a dialogue, but also that first bit of information that I see, which is you know typically their resume or their LinkedIn profile or or other bits of information that might be um, you know out there on the internet about them. So. Again, I think it's, it goes back to how they construct their story. 
Okay, another question from the community um, is on interview situations. So this is one for you, Tyson. Um, the community feel like they never really know how to respond to the question, what's your biggest strength and what's your biggest weakness? Can you give some examples of good answers that you've heard uh, from that in an interview scenario or any advice to, uh, to candidates who are coming into an interview and get asked that? Um, so I think in, in reality, um, the best answers are the ones that are truthful <laughs> and, and, and really coming from a candidate's experience. Um, you know, there, yeah, there, there can be canned answers on, you know, this is my biggest strength or this is my, my you know, biggest weakness. Um, but in reality, the, if you're dealing with a good uh, interviewer, they're, they're going to have kind of picked up on those canned things. Um, and they're they're going to actually also pick up on something that is truthful and coming from the heart. Um, so if an interviewer thinks that they're going to get those types of questions, so for example, I, I often like to ask what's someone's favorite book, um, because sometimes that gives me insight into um, you know their problem solving skills and things that they're interested in, not just necessarily information security related. Um, you know, before you go into interviews, you should probably think through some of those types of questions and you know what what how you would answer it, and meaning thing, and and again from from a truthful standpoint, um, would be probably the best um, approach that someone can take if they if they get those types of questions. How do you like to run your interviews? Do, do you do technical tests with candidates? Do you is it question and answer? Do you get them to run through a problem and, and approach how? How they're thinking, or I'm sure it's different for um, every role. So it's it, a, a normal structure. Yeah, it <laughs> it, it is. It's a, it's constructed a little bit different based on the role. Um, but it, as I kind of alluded to, um, obviously we want to make sure that they're going to be a skills fit for the role. So we do ask obviously some technical questions, um, but we typically do it in a scenario format and ask them to try and solve a problem versus what's the command or whatever that you need to run to do this. Because um, it's, it's more important uh, that folks understand how to solve a problem versus an un, like, a particular detail that you can, let's say, Google or something like that, right? Um, and then, the, the, again, the other th two elements that we look at is, you know, culture fit um, and then malleability, right? The, the ability for the candidate to, to be uh, flexible in the position that we're putting them in. Um, so that, that's generally how we structure an interview and the three things that we're, we're generally looking for in, in, in an interview. Perfect. I think we're pretty much done on questions. There, there is one other which I'm going to uh, address from the UK sense, um, which I can, uh, I'd like to ask both of you as well, your point of view. In the HR profession and with recruiters, there are more and more recruiters coming into the industry, jumping onto the sexy cyber security bandwagon, uh, I love a, a lovely quote there. Um, what do you think, or are, are you aware of any initiatives to really professionalise that industry? Um, I know there's one in the UK which I'm going to mention, which is something called CERIS, which is the Confederation of Ethical Recruiters and Information Security, which is something that's been brought up with uh, CREST. Um, recruiters have worked with CREST to put in place a standard and a professional um, code of conduct for recruiters in the UK, which to be on that list, um, which is something we're going through at the moment, you have to have uh, references from both clients and from candidates of you personally as a recruiter having placed in those roles and sign up um, to continuous professional development with a small membership fee uh, over the year. So that's something that's been put in place in the UK uh, to try and professionalise and, and standardise information security recruitment. Have you guys got anything similar in the US that you're aware of, that you're maybe a member of, or, or that you know is an initiative within the community to try and professionalize that, those recruiters? I'm not aware of anything over here in the US. I've been contacted by a few sort of, um, you know, ranking the information security recruiters in the US and, and stuff like that. And when I've done some digging, like, you know, okay, how do we get ranked? What questions do you ask us? And the, unfortunately, yeah. the response is often, we have number three spot available at $7,000. Um, 
So, um, I, yeah, the, that's not the, the right way to do it. <laughs> no, I don't like you know. I don't. It doesn't. It doesn't feel that good. Uh, you know, I did see. I saw a competitor advertising or or or, or mailing out how they'd just been ranked in the same thing uh, at number seven, and I was like, oh my goodness, you know. This this isn't this isn't how it should be done, um, and and so that's the only thing I've really seen over here. So I, I can't say for sure that that um, there's anything sort of specifically going, you know, focusing on on that. I, uh, I know that you know there is a, a, a difference, and often people get mixed up between you know human resources and, and recruitment, and, and and there is a. a, a Difference, you know, recruit, recruitment is often sort of part of a human and course human resources person's um, role, or often a, a completely separate position within a human resources department. So it's not always the the same thing. Um, I I can't talk much other than you know I've I've worked previously for other recruitment companies and um, and having now you know had my own and, and trained multiple staff up here. I definitely think there's a difference in the way you go about doing it, um, and but you know I think that's a personal thing. You know who's your mentor, who drives it that way. You know how do you make sure they've got experience? For us, it's been very involved in the community. Um, you know, spending our evenings going to events and and mixing with technical people to have a good understanding of of you know of the technical areas. We're slightly different as a company because my business partners are. are pen tester and a security specialist so we've had you know we've I've got technical people in house we have a professional services arm to our business so I have pen testers I've got um two virtual CISOs that go that out and do policy that. work so we have access to that yeah. which is a little bit different but I don't know of any sort of any any departments that are, uh, or any sort of things that are happening much like the UK I do think actually Luke the UK and I might be a bit biased because I come from there but I, I do think that a, the UK often leads the way with a lot of this sort of stuff, and I've certainly seen more professional, more professionalism in recruiting with um, UK recruiters coming over and get involved with with, with US ones. So. Um, okay. Well, that's that's positive for me, anyway. <laughs> um, I'm going to wrap it up there because we're almost at the end of time. I'm sure that we've had um, some interesting points. I hope the community are, are really interested in what we're doing, and I hope we can roll this out as a series of different podcasts so i would like to thank both tyson and chris thank you very much for attending thank you for uh, getting involved and i'd like to throw out to the community if you like what you've heard today if you have any burning questions i'm sure all three of us will be happy to come back um, and answer any questions uh, in the comments of the podcast but also if there is anything um, that, that the community wants us to talk about in future podcasts i'm sure I know I'd like to be involved again if, if both of yourselves would be as well. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Rosie, and thanks for, for getting involved and taking this by the horns. That's that's me. That's what I like to do. <laughs> <laughs> same, same here. Thank you, Rosie.